You are listening to E Radio by Mist Apex. We are electric. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the E Radio Show. Today's episode is called When Yanni Comes Marching Home, which, frankly, only the aging Americans amongst our listeners are likely to get. I'm Matt Trumpets, and today I'm joined by Chris Stevens. Chris, how are you doing today? Good, good. It's good to be back on the airways, recharge the batteries over the winter, and I just cannot wait to, to get back into formerly action again. Yes. Uh, unfortunately for us, the grin that is currently on your face cannot be described in a family-friendly fashion. However, your excitement is plain to see for everyone who's watching at home. And we have a special guest today joining us again, Luke Smith. How's it going, Luke? And welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Really good to be back on. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for asking. We're super excited that you're you're willing to continue joining us in our coverage of Formula E because uh, we value your insight and we know, and we'll get to it later, that you have some exciting changes in your life that you might be wanting to talk about. Yeah, it's all go for 2018, so it should be pretty good. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, let's get to it, shall we, with some big, dirty news. Big Dirty News. So, see, I thought it was going to catch Stevens off guard, but look at him. He's so ready to go. He was he had the bumper to hand. Very impressive. Very impressive. So the biggest, dirtiest news, of course, is that Neil Yanni has left Dragon after just one race weekend. And Jose Maria Lopez is coming back, which I admit I'm a bit excited for. So who does that look worse for? Chris? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's quite a messy breakup that's happened, um, really, although I'm pretty sure all the parties involved are presenting it as cleanly as possible. And it was a fairly amicable split between Yanni and Dragon. It just kind of wasn't going the way they expected. That's what Yanni said. Uh, anyway, I mean, we know that this uh, Porsche tie-in fell through. Uh, Dragon said thank you, but no thank you. And they've kind of got the uh, the worst car on the grid uh from hong kong they're the only team who didn't score uh, any points so you can understand uh why yani uh was uh was wanting a, a way out um frankly i i don't think it reflects well on on dragon um particularly and and yani you know he's he he can't really come out of this looking badly um, because in you know a car as bad as that, you know there's you, there's your escape clause. Um, but apparently he's quite keen to sort of stick around and maybe do Formula E again in the future. Well, now that's kind of fascinating. And and correct me if I'm wrong, but but was not Dragon originally tied up with Faraday Future? Yeah, yeah, it was. And you know, there's been so much negative press about Faraday uh, this past year um, that it's kind of understandable that. Uh, this car has has come in and and not performed uh, instantly. I mean, I'd be very keen to to know actually how it's affected Faraday in the development of this car uh, and how much of it is actually you know Faraday produced and how much Dragon had to oversee all that. Luke, I don't know if you've got any more information on that. Uh yeah, I think it's it's been uh, a very odd breakup, as you said. I think we all kind of imagined that. Faraday was where the problems really lay in that team through last season. Um, but now Dragon have come into season four and they look they look so far up the pace. And yeah, um, Neil was very scathing with his words uh, after Hong Kong. He said, we need improvement. Said, um, I can see the cars pulling away from me on the straight. And uh, he was really unhappy. Uh, Jerome D'Ambrosio off the record as well was really, really not happy and said it was going to be a long, long, long season. Um, yeah, so I think it's uh, it's a big story. It's a surprising story. But not entirely unexpected. I think Neil thought that he would rather maybe take a step out of Formula E and find a seat somewhere else or just continue to focus on his LMP1 GTs if he wants to get in the frame for that Porsche Formula E drive in season six uh, rather than spend a year uh, tootling about at the back of the grid. It does make a lot of sense. Didn't he say that four tenths or something he was losing just on the straights yeah. in Hong Kong? Now that's Hong Kong's got a couple more straights and longer straights than you normally see on a Formula E track, but that is still quite a significant disadvantage. It just doesn't seem to have drivability, power, or efficiency, which are the three the three big things you need in Formula E. So just out of curiosity, it seems to me that perhaps 
given the fact that a lot of what has been written about Faraday had to do with their finances, is this possibly like a cumulative deficit we're seeing across two seasons now, a total lack of development money for last season and going into this season? Or do you think this is just really uh, a problem starting this season for Dragon? It's kind of a, a, a fresh issue because their season three powertrain had very little, if anything, to do with Faraday because they only signed that deal or at least announced it at the end of season two. And when I spoke to the the drivers at the beginning of season three testing, they were telling me that you know, Faraday have got pretty much nothing to do with with the car at that stage. So as as far as I'm aware, this is their first attempt. Right, but would Faraday not also bring some investment money to the team itself? That's really what I'm asking about. Uh, okay, I, I mean, you would, yeah, a manufacturer probably would come in and, and provide a little bit of um, support in that aspect. But given the headlines we've been seeing about them, that is probably something they're lacking. I think it also comes down to a personnel issue as well. There are some big, big gaps in that team. Uh, I, I believe uh, Neil was without a, a data engineer, for example, in Hong Kong. And there was a, a confusion over who would and would be at, would not be at the race. Um as an example, the team's got uh, their uh, logistics manager doing their PR as well at the moment. There is, um, it's just a, b- a bit of a mess on the Dragon side. And I think uh, maybe Faraday, that has been able to sort of paste over some of the cracks and maybe cover up some of the, the problems with Dragon. But now this is back to being a pure Dragon operation. Um, I think we're seeing the issues come up again. Yeah, harks of Tachita at the beginning of last uh, season when they were a complete uh, hot mess. But look, I wonder if you... Um knew any any more about supposedly Penske saying thanks but no thanks to to Porsche and 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 that deal is that actually you know the case um as far as i know yeah uh, they were offered uh, a handful of engineers to work with them through the season uh, but i think it wasn't it wasn't a deal like the one between hwa and venturi for example which is laying the foundations for mercedes entry it did very much seem a case of porsche wanting to offer some of its expertise and its sort of knowledge to uh, to the dragon operation and then in return be able to prepare for its own entry um Penske, maybe he wanted to sort of be protective of his, of his own assets. He didn't want Porsche getting involved with Dragon. He wanted to keep it as his own team. Um, I don't know. But, yeah, you've got to think that for a team that has really been backmarkers for last season and definitely are this season, um, to offer some engineers and the top know-how from an LMP1 operation that has dominated WEC for the last three years, uh, it's, uh, it's a very odd move, definitely. Because, I mean, it would be different if they were competitive last season. But last season, they had their worst season in its, in its, its short history. They were race winners in the first two seasons. And, and now we're just seeing more of the same of this as a, a back market team and quite substantially a back market team. And it, it, in terms of the short term, it makes no sense whatsoever. I don't know what Penske's got planned for, you know, his, his mid to long term uh, vision, but certainly in the short term, it's a bad call yeah definitely and uh i think it shades of uh neo next tv from uh, season two when they were just miles off the pace and it, it it kind of it demoralizes the drivers you've got ones left uh jose maria lopez has signed up but that really for him is just a way back into the series you can't imagine he's going to be uh thinking of dreaming scoring any podium finishes or anything like that uh jerome this will be his second season of sort of being at the back basically um and as we saw with nelson pk at next ev there's only so long it can go on before you go i've had enough there's only so many promises you can take before you say i'm leaving and uh, find something better so i'm finding the comparison to neo to be interesting do you think that long term penske does have some kind of a sponsorship or some sort of deal because i mean frankly over in the over here in the u.s they're a fairly well-regarded team they seem to run a pretty button-down operation And this doesn't seem to be reflected at all in what's going on overseas in Formula E. So any whispers, any knowledge, any thoughts on that? Nothing that I've heard of. Um, I think this really is just sort of shown for the first time publicly just what a mess the team is actually in. Um, Yeah, they've got a lot of work to do now because all of the other like teams and independents, they're working hard to either get a manufacturer tie up such as uh, Cheetah and Virgin or uh, like Mahindra really make their own operations so efficient and so well, uh, well oiled uh, that it's able to win races and Dragon seems to be pretty lost right now. I feel in that Neo comparison, Neo have got the escape clause in 
that they they were still using the that twin motor layout, which I think a lot of people are sort of coming to the conclusion that it's not the way to go. Uh, especially after, especially after season two and season three, it got a bit better, but it still wasn't, you know, what it, it needed to be. So I feel like they had that escape clause, whereas Dragon have maybe got a few question marks over it. I mean, you have to wonder how much uh, they know about their own problems. Definitely. And, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's just looking like there's no, there's no real reason behind it apart from splitting with a, a major partner, but one that had only really negative headlines for the team. The team was very, very eager to distance itself from Faraday. Um, but in doing so, it's kind of uh, lost that guess out clause, I guess you could say. I mean, Marco Matti actually lasted less time at Faraday than he did at Ferrari. That's already, that was a great start, wasn't it? Mm. <laughs> it just seems to me, thinking about it, that perhaps maybe Penske was counting on Faraday to do a lot of the developing. And with that falling apart, they don't have the staff or the infrastructure to do it on their own, uh, which still begs the question of why they wouldn't be willing to share with Porsche some of their knowledge in return for some of that support, because that's clearly their weak point. Yeah, definitely. It seems to be yeah, cutting off their nose in spite of their face. It's uh, it's formally at the moment, you need to either be a big manufacturer willing to spend so much money and really work hard to get to the front like Jaguar, like Renault, like Aldi, or you need to be um, you need to be tied up with someone. You can't do this on your own. Um, Mahindra, I think, have, have been excellent in what they've done. They're probably the best example of an independent. Um, but Dragon, there's there's none of it. It's a team that keeps changing, keeps changing identities all the time as well well um and there's no consistency there's no stability there so i think maybe this season they've got to kind of write off and just think let's just get grounded and get everybody on the same page and then from sort of season five season six start afresh and hope for the best well isn't that going to be a a goal for quite a lot of teams really because obviously season five is when the big change is coming uh, where we go to uh, single car uh, races and we're getting rid of the pit stops it almost makes sense to kind of uh, do a Honda in 2009 where you scrap a couple of years and focus on the big uh, change. Uh, not that a lot of teams you know, haven't already been doing the development. I mean, they've been working on that for two, three years, uh, some of them. But I suppose for Dragon, they've got less, a lot less to lose at this point. Definitely, yeah. Um, but that doesn't stop the short-term pain. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a tough season for them. And uh Yarny going, that's a, it doesn't look good. It really doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. And, and that just brings up one more question, which is, uh, could this be the, do you see Penske willing to continue committing resources to this, given the way things have gone the last two seasons? Um, I think so. I think he's, he's always been a big uh, advocate and uh, sort of, uh, very committed to the series, which is very good to see. Um, I think season five, season six as well, probably be make or break. But the more we have manufacturers showing an interest in the championship and wanting to get involved, I think the more likely it is that you're going to have to sort of broaden your horizons a bit and not be this sort of uh, isolated operation, which is how Dragon seem right now. Turning down Porsche help is, uh, yeah, seems very unwise indeed. Yeah, but uh, I kind of get the viewpoint too that if other manufacturers are looking for a way in and Porsche is not willing to commit to that partnership, you know, maybe, maybe holding on to your entry and waiting for another manufacturer who is willing to commit might be a better long-term move, but it's certainly not going to make things easy in the short term. No, I agree with that. I think, um, yeah, if you have a, for instance, a Toyota come along and they want an entry and they want a team to work with and, yeah, Dragon may be an option, but Dragon needs to prove they can be a team that can work with a manufacturer. Um, I think, for example, BMW Andretti, that, that's that been a, a very interesting partnership because BMW have got there and found a lot of issues. Uh, I think that Dragon have really got to present themselves as being a team that a manufacturer could work with. And at the moment, they really don't look like that. They're going to have a harder time of it than, say, Virgin, who have, have done pretty well with, with DS. Mm. And so when when they need to start looking for somebody else, I think they're probably the the top team that a lot of manufacturers will want to work with coming straight in. And after that, they'll be, we'll, we'll we'll settle for a Dragon or a, a, an Andretti or whoever. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Excellent. Well, that's not even the only news we have because we have now confirmed the post Marrakesh rookie test lineup, and it looks 
very confusing to me. Tell me a little bit about what's going on and who maybe you're excited about seeing. Well, there are some really, really great drivers in here. Um, and there are some that people have messaged me that, who the hell is this guy? Um, but I've brought along some notes to help us along the way. Obviously, the likes of uh, Nick DeFree, Antonio Giovinazzi, Paul DeResta, we'll all be very familiar with, uh, Joel Eriksson as well from Formula 3, Maximilian Gunther as well, uh, Harry Tinknell, we should remember, who tested the uh, Jaguar at the beginning of the last season. He's done a lot of testing for Neo as well. Uh, James Rossiter, he was doing Valencia, Daniel Juncadella as well uh, there's a few ones uh, Alexander Alban uh, will be familiar with from Formula 2 uh, Michael Benyai was at Valencia as well and actually I found out that he uh, won the Formula Renault 2.0 NEC this year without taking a race win I believe which is quite quite impressive in 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 some ways but there are some um that uh, people are, are less familiar with we'll start with Pietro Fittipaldi uh, who's in the Jaguar he was the last Formula V8 3.5 uh, champion. Uh, then we've got Andrea Calderelli, who is in the Dragon, uh, and he's most uh, known for his Super GT appearances. He was third in the championship uh, this year. Uh, and this one I'm worried I'm going to pronounce wrong, but it's uh, Mitsunori Takaboshi, who is the Japanese Formula 3 champion uh, this year. Sam De Jong, officially Mahindra Sim and Development Driver. Uh, another one I'm worried about pronouncing wrong. Frederick uh, Makaviki, I believe. Uh, you may know him from uh, some Le Mans drives with Porsche in the GT Pro. Bruno Spengler, a 2012 DTM uh, champion and a few appearances at the 24 Hours of Daytona. Uh, Colton Herter, that's one I'm pretty excited about. Um, you'll know him from Indy Lights. On this side of the pond, I know him from the MSA Formula which is now British Formula 4. And I remember him being, being very good in that. Um, so I'm, I'm quite excited about him. Uh, Alexander Imperatori, I believe that's how you pronounce it, uh, former Rebellion LMP1. And um, Nico Muller, uh, Audi DTM uh, driver. So they all sort of make, it, uh, make sense in, in their own um, little uh, ways. It's either, you know, sort of factory um, tie-ins or... Um, sponsorship all, all that kind of stuff uh in terms of like who we're quite excited by uh yeah colton hurt uh, and you got how you can't not be excited about antonio giovanazzi in a in a, in a formal league because he should be in formula one this year for, for my money okay luke who excites you most on that list who are you who are you most interested in seeing in in the car uh yeah i think i agree giovanazzi is really the headliner in this uh in this rookie test he's an excellent excellent driver um i agree chris should be in formula one by now i think that does show just how highly regarded formula e is now becoming it's a an opportunity for youngsters to get some track time to try something a bit different and uh really prove themselves so i think that's great uh, pietro fittipaldi absolutely excellent in 3.5 um very impressive porsche lmp1 test as well in bahrain really excited to see him uh maximilian gunther um, um, his uh, Formula 3 stuff has been absolutely fantastic the last couple of years. So he, again, should be impressive. Uh, yeah, otherwise, I think those are really the ones standing out for me. Colton Herter, uh, I think, will be the first driver I see on track who was born after the year 2000s, which is uh, one to make us feel all very old, I'm sure. Ouch. Stevens, you were looking to get in. Yeah, what I like about this list, I mean, some people are going to look at some of these names like Giovinazzi, like Nick DeFree, like Paul DeResta, and say, oh, it's more of the F1 reject syndrome that formerly has but you got you got to look at it in in this uh, another way a very high profile names are potentially considering formula e as you know a, you know an, an alternative future for them because let's face it not everyone does get into formula one it doesn't mean they're bad at all but i love the fact that you've also got a lot of younger drivers uh that are in the sort of the middle stage of their career before they get a big break in a a, a big single seater uh series that are looking at formerly e as the, their next step their, their way forward and uh or even the end goal I'd, I'd love to know how many of them uh are, are, are aiming at a seat in the near future good enough then but do we see formula e becoming a place that these drivers are aiming or is it still either a stepping stone on the way up or the way down from formula one uh, for most of these drivers 
Um, I say somewhere that aiming now. I think if you can't be in Formula One, which let's face it, majority of drivers can't be, there's only 22 seats. Um, then uh, yeah, I think Formula Formula E is really the place to be. It's a place where you can be a, a professional driver. You can balance that with some WEC, for example, or Super GT or any other series. So I think uh, yeah, lots of youngsters nowadays they're not they're not snubbing it. They're not on this sort of Formula One or nothing uh, mentality anymore. They are looking at series such as Formula E, uh, which is why I think you see such a big interest in this rookie test. I think part of that as well is maybe Formula One's politics have become a little bit more visible to to the majority of people. I think maybe a lot of drivers just think, mm, I don't really want to get involved in, in that and so if they can pick up a, a Formula E slash WEC drive to to see them through their career I think that's it, it's first of all it's a very healthy decision uh, as well well I'm curious now I'm going to ask you this it seems like Super Formula has been the place to put drivers to continue to race while you're waiting for a seat in Formula One do we see Formula E starting to be an equal um, I'm I'm not sure because I think Super Formula has been very good because of the speed of the cars and it is very much a preparation for F1. Um, Stoffel Van Dorn said that when he stepped up with these 2017 cars in, in F1 um, last year, uh, it didn't feel much different because of the force of the Super Formula car and everything like that. Um, I think Formula E is a lot slower. I mean, it's we love it. It's but it's still nowhere near the kind of uh, I think physical exertion that Formula One will give you. Um, so I, I don't. I think it's a series that you may see drivers do maybe, yeah, as as a thing on the side, like we saw Pierre Gasly, for example, stepping in New York. Um, but I think as a, a real full time series um, to prepare for F one, I still don't think Formula E is quite at that level yet. No, there's nobody going to be graduating from Formula E to go to Formula One is there because they're just two completely uh, different things that'll be the day uh but i can see it being the other way around or people just not doing formula one in entirely well i'll tell you what interests me about it is it is it super formula very much has the arrow and the speed you know it's 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 a rival to gp2 but you you can you can race on a lot of the tracks that you're going to see what Formula E offers is the energy management component of Formula One driving in particular. And and that's not to be overlooked, I, I would say, because you can see how busy the drivers are. But still, maybe we shouldn't even be making the direct comparison and judging it by Formula One because there are lots of series out there. But since that's our other interest, that's why I bring it up. Uh, but also, Formula E will, will kick you for, for trying to compare it to Formula One. I mean, we're only just getting onto the full Monaco layout. Ah, finally. Finally. I don't know. Right? I like it. I am in the minority here, but I like the, the shortened Monaco. See, Luke's shaking his head at me no, now. Just but... no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, the other adult. Oh, the right, because there's going to be so much more overtaking once we use the full version. Well, uh, yes. Yes, actually, relative to what we had previously, which was just a lot of crashing at the first turn. That was one time. One time. All right. Well, I, I say that not only do we have a post-race test coming up, but we have an actual race coming up as well. So perhaps we should have a quick look at the Marrakesh preview. Right. So we had Marrakesh last year. What do we think of the circuit? Is it a winner, a loser, or just an interesting stop on the world tour? I like it. It's quite unique in Formula E in that it's an actual purpose-built facility. Uh, and it's it's quite a good track. It's, again, very different to most Formula E tracks in that it's got maybe a couple more straights. It's not quite the tight, uh, you know, left to right 90 degree style corners that we're used to. The, the, the first sector is actually quite uh, flowing. It's got quite a few long uh, corners in there and some tricky braking zones. And it, it provided quite an entertaining race last year. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm a fan of it as well. Um, I think it's it's a purpose-built track as 
Chris said. Um, but also, we've not seen a series like Formula One go there. So it's not like Monaco, for example, where people do go, oh, it looks really slow. Um, it's compared to touring cars, so similar speed, which is great. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a cool track. It's not your typical Formula E circuit, which is a street course with hairpins and ninety degree corners. It's uh, it's a proper proper circuit, so uh, uh, we should be good. Uh, one of the longest on the calendar as well, if not the longest. So uh, in terms of strategy, I think things are going to be quite uh, quite tight for teams. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they uh, spice things up and uh, whether we can open the window a little bit more on on that front. See, we couldn't be further away from Hong Kong then, could we? Because that is one of the, the shorter tracks uh, of, of the year. Uh, not necessarily the shortest, but certainly shorter than the most. And the, the strategy window is quite uh, wide there. And in terms of its its layout as well, because it's such a unique track, we'll probably end up seeing another shift in uh, the, the, the grid order which we already can't really work out, even after <laughs> two races. You know, this By this time last year, we probably had it figured out by now that, oh, you've got these guys here and then these guys and these guys, and yeah, a Dragon and Venturi at the back. Uh, but th- this year we've got seven or eight teams I would put down for a win. So uh, don't ask me who I think is going to win because there's 16 options there. Well, 15. Okay. So who's going to be nearer the front? Who, who's your money on based on the circuit characteristics? Because you said with longer straights, probably it's going to be about efficiency, who's got better region and thermal management, and who can deploy more on on the straights for longer periods of time without overwhelming that. Well, based off of just the, the race one uh, performance, you'd have to say DS Virgin and Sam Bird have got to be up there because that was just such a, a dominant um, display. And the, the efficiency was so strong, but then there were so many little asterisks against his opponents that they, oh, they were stuck behind this guy and then this happened and this happened as well. That so they didn't really end up where they should have been. So you've got to throw in Mahindra as, as well and Audi still, who are, you know, he, Daniel Atwood was right up there. Lucas has got to find, uh, something, um, to, to try and balance that out. And, you know, for him and Boemi as well, they've, got to make a big impact after leaving that well should have left with no points but the app disqualification went when we did actually score a point that weekend yeah they've they've really got to dig deep um i i think it, it really surprised us all to see the two big manufacturers uh uh renault and uh audi struggling so so much but audi took a lot of confidence from their displays um there was a, a lot of bad luck for lucas i think in both races so i think he and uh daniel who was excellent and so harshly robbed of his uh, victory i think they will be up there um uh for the for this uh the, the coming race um yeah i think we're gonna see um probably uh renault looking good obviously jaguar their qualifying pace is excellent race pace a little less so so they may struggle i think uh particularly on a longer circuit um so uh yeah but it's so open as you say we we had i think five teams hit the podium um in hong kong it's so so hard to try and pick who who's up front who's second how the pecking order is shaping up um which is really exciting it means we go into a race not with a clue who's going to be on top um whereas yeah this time last year we knew it's probably gonna be waiting see and i i love the just how different it is compared to last year but if you were going to take sort of who you would definitely expect to see right at the the sharp end of the pecking order you would say virgin mahindra and you'd expect Audi and Renault to sort of throw their name into the hat as well. Venturi as well, you know. I mean, Mortara almost won his second um, Epri. Um, but then in terms of the podium as well, uh, we sh- definitely should not discount uh, Jaguar. Like I say, great qualifying um, pace. To Cheetah, uh, I think they need to work on their race pace a little bit as well. Um, but then Andretti and Neo very nearly scored podiums themselves in Hong Kong. I, that went under the radar a little bit because Turvey was running in a strong third place, holding everybody off before uh, the car shut down. Uh, da Costa, for my money, should have been fighting for the podium in the in the, in the second uh, race in Hong Kong, but then um, the car didn't start in uh, during the pit stop, and that's what cost him. Um, so as long as they can keep on top of that, um, then... I'd say they they should be in for a few surprises as well. Really, the only co- thing I can say with some confidence is that Dragon will be towards the back, which is horrible to say. I don't mean to just be really mean to Dragon, but it's I'm trying to deal in facts here. Yeah, well, if they were losing four tenths on the straight in Hong Kong, you know, you you sort of silently weep for what's going to happen 
in Marrakesh. Yeah, I think that's uh, that, that's very true. It, this this circuit really, really does not work to Dragon Strength. So uh, I think uh, it, it may it may be a baptism of fire for Jose Maria Lopez on his uh, return to the series. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be exciting though. I think we can safely say we have got nine out of ten teams that could be on the podium. Um, any series would absolutely kill to have a, a sort of uh, some variety like that, um, which is good news for everyone except if you're Dragon. But do you remember after Valencia testing and we were really worried about this this Audi race pace that was apparently a second a lap quicker than everyone else and they were going to dominate the the year? I, I, I mean, no disrespect to Audi, but I just love that that hasn't happened. And now you've said that, it's going to happen. No, oh, no, 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 I've yeah. jinxed it. Jinx oh, I've it. ruined it. I'm so sorry. All right. Now that you've ruined everything, Stephen, um, I would say it's time for comment of the week, but... The closest thing to a comment of the week would be My Money's on Felix Rosenquist by Artemy EX. So congratulations for playing along. Um, but we have um, we have a moment, and we should take a little bit of the show to talk to Luke and find out what he's been up to and what he's about to be up to, because big change in your life, my friend. Yeah, yeah. Um, I Obviously, anyone who follows my work will know that I've spent the uh, yeah, last five uh, five seasons with NBC Sports. Um, obviously, they've lost uh, broadcasting rights in the United States for 2018. So, uh, yeah, I've moved on from then. Uh, yeah, big, big change. And, uh, yeah, it's um, it's been a, a big shift, um, personally, I think, over the winter. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's um, it's just one of those things, really. It was it, disappointing news. But um, hopefully ESPN can carry on the excellent work in the United States, an amazing market full of knowledgeable fans, really deserve the best coverage they can get. Um, Yeah, uh, I've not got uh, everything 100% sorted for this year yet, but I would say it's 95% sorted. So uh, it's going to be good. I'm going to be across Formula One, Formula E, WEC, which is exciting. And uh, yeah, hopefully more more details will come soon. But um, it's uh, it's 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 uh, been a, a big change, though, definitely. So it sounds like you're going to land on your feet from this one, which is really great news to hear because, you know, speaking personally, I've always enjoyed your coverage and feel like you, you do bring some real insight that not every journalist, <clears throat> Stevens, brings to their articles as well. Oh, thank you. That's very, very appreciated. <laughs> I Just because I don't spend 2,000 words on qualifying because no one's going to read it, what well, I don't bring insight. I bring the people what they want. All right, fine. You and me, we'll, we'll, we'll let Luke read both of our stuff. He can decide which he likes better. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> I will let the viewing figures decide this one. I'll send you my stuff from Hong Kong and you tell me how good your qualifying report did. All right, then. All right. I, I have no idea, actually, how many people read it, but I don't Do, care. It doesn't even do read up on his statistics. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do not have time for worrying about things like that. I have bigger fish to fry. So you're going to be covering Formula One, you th- Formula One, Formula E. Any other disciplines going to be in there for you, Luke? Uh, WEC will be another big one as well. Um, so I think uh, I think there's one stretch where I've got yeah, possibly 13 race weekends in 14 weeks where I'll be at the circuit. So it's uh, it's going to be a busy year, but it's it's exciting. And yeah, it's it's what it's what I've wanted to do since I started out. So, uh, yeah, it'll be good. Um, but uh, Formula E is a series that, yeah, a few people said to me, well, if you're doing more Formula One, would you want to drop that? But no, it's such a good championship and uh, it's so important, I think, for the future of motorsport. So uh, definitely eager to keep a, a foothold in there, certainly. See, I d- definitely have that same sort of feeling. Whenever it comes to weekends uh, with clashes on Formula Spy, where we have F1 and the FE, I'm always the one to keep pushing the FE um, stuff. And I remember in Hong Kong last year when uh, the qu- end of qualifying would clash with the start of the Grand Prix in Japan. And I was so eager to try and just keep, no, we can keep pushing the, it's the Super Bowl. <laughs> it's going to be really exciting. No one cares about the Grand Prix anyway. It's going to be really boring. So, I, there was an argument I lost, but but it was you know it was the effort that counted. Well, I have an update to our comment of the week. Artemy still wins, but now he's 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 gone proper in. He said winning for lack of competition feels too USA two thousand five. So there we go. There we have a real winner of comment of the week. 
But uh, Luke is not the only one with some potential news there, Stephen. My my joking aside, you've actually accomplished something, much to everyone's surprise. Yeah, for once in my life. Um, no, I I had my autosport.com slash motorsport.com uh, debut with some uh some moto gp uh work over the winter um that uh, they wanted me to write and so i was i was very pleased i was very 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 pleased to have that um over the winter i've had maybe three or four published now over over the winter and um i've i've got some more stuff in a few more things uh potentially for for this year and um a little bit more bike stuff with uh with motorsport um, cause they're, they're, they're quite big on the bike stuff, um, motorsport, which is good for me. Cause I like, I like bike racing. I know you and spanners don't, don't understand it or whatever, but bike racing is just amazing. And so, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be able to, uh, to, to, to dip my toe in that one as well. I used to race bicycles, so I think that's probably more spanners than me, but you're right. I don't follow, uh, MotoGP and the other bike series as closely as I do car racing. Um, you should. I probably, if I had the time, I would. Oh, it's I, always I the time. time. I tried to keep an eye on 40 different series last year, and it did not pan out the way I hoped. No, it is, it is, it is challenging just to cover, like, two, never mind 40. But that's not it. You, you might have a surprise for us up and coming. I mean, you, you are moving ahead, aren't you? There, there are things potentially on your horizon that we're not at liberty to talk about. Um, potentially, yeah. I don't want to. I don't. I, I don't want to jinx anything. So no, I'm not gonna. No. I'm not gonna talk about it. We're just teasing the audience a little bit. And I might even. I maybe tiny tiny chance. I might be up to something myself, which would maybe result in some fun things uh, further down the line. This is not uh, musical related. No, this. I'm. I, I am still working on the album. Thanks for asking. But no, this is not music related. This is motorsports related. Well, nice. we'll have to see. It could be a challenge. This is I, we're all just yeah we're getting up to stuff. We can't tell you what it is. This is a very aspirational podcast. People yeah. listen and yeah, they want to do stuff. It's great. It's the new year. Why not? Right? New year, new me. Yeah. Oh, oh no, you're not one of those guys. Well, since, well, since we do, we may as well talk about the Missed Apex podcast and what we got lined up for that as well because there are there's a project in the works that we're quite excited about um i think spanners has talked about it in terms of a a karting uh video um i think we're still quite keen on uh doing that one that's still in the works um we've even got our karting event in milton Keynes um coming up on the 27th um and i'm pretty sure I, i'm pretty one of us should uh at least video some stuff from it for the for the twitters um so hopefully and uh, if any of you are, uh, are coming to that we look forward to seeing you and i, I think 2018 is just going to be more and more of what we built up on in 2017 for Missed Apex podcast. Um, so, uh, yeah, harder, better, faster, stronger. Absolutely. And if you are missing Spanners, don't forget you can find him as the pit lane reporter for the British Rental Cart Championship on YouTube the 20th and 21st of January, streamed live. We're going to have the top UK carters, and it's also a qualifying event for the World Rental Cart Championships. I think Will Buxton, Alex Van Jean, and Bradley Philpot himself might be in attendance. And I hear there might be a few spots left for anybody who wants to get on the actual racing action. Uh, get in touch with Bradley Philpot. They're looking for a few good drivers. Well, okay, a few drivers with the cash to participate. Who am I kidding? So we got, we got Buxton, Philpot, and, and Van Jean. That is about as hit and miss as this formerly rookie test list. Absolutely. So, Luke, are you going to participate now? Are you going to be racing? Um, I think I'll leave it to the professionals. No, um, you did well in that next EV karting event last year. I or came something. third, actually. I came third. Um, so, yeah, why not? <laughs> I bet Brad would give you a lesson before you jumped in. That would be fine, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much to Luke Smith. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much to Chris Steven. Uh, thank you. And remember, chicks dig heels, wounds cause scars, and glory is a fungible concept under certain philosophical precepts. This has been E-Radio Show. <laughs> <laughs>